The first thing I want to complete with you is a bit of a chronology of hadith so that you get an idea before I move on to today's topic which is fiqh and sharia which is deriving Islamic law. Very quickly you will find that if you were, and this is con- actually continuing what we did yesterday that the earliest compilers of the topical collections prior to this again there were individual sahaba who wrote down some or all of the hadith and then from the time of the tabin and tabai tabin you have these early compilers of topical collections such as imam malik all the way down to imam al-uzai and you get a rough idea that their dates of births are roughly 80s or 90s then what you have is as i'd mentioned to you in the very first phase of mass textualization Understand something. Again, as I explained to you yesterday, one thing is the existence of knowledge. The second is the transmission of that knowledge. The third is the textualization of that knowledge. Existence of the knowledge of Sunnah, that was that long presentation on all those verses from Quran, that the Quran Karim itself establishes the existence of the knowledge of Sunnah. Transmission of Sunnah, first transmission was oral by Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam and received in the hearts and lives and practice of Sahab Ikram. Not received in their notebooks. Received in the hearts and lives and practice of Sahab Ikram. But as we showed you yesterday, Sahab Ikram did also begin writing down the Hadith. And the next generation of transmission was also oral. Was also oral. This is now from the Sahaba to the Tabin. And again, it was delivered to the hearts, lives, and practice of the Tabin. Now in the age of the Tabin, age of Tabin means there are two types of people, Tabin and Tabai Tabin, right? Age of the Prophet ﷺ means two types of people, Nabi Karim ﷺ and Sahaba. Age of Sahaba, Sahaba and Tabin. So in the age of the Tabin, which means there are two types of people, the teachers are called Tabin, the students are called Tabai Tabin, because the deen of Islam has spread so vastly, so now there was a mass textualization. A very conscious effort in Umar bin Abdul Aziz, is credited, but should not be exclusively credited, but is largely credited with this mass Textualization of hadith. Mass means actually a willful, deliberate, collaborative effort to textualize, means write down every single hadith mentioned by Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and transmitted by Sahaba as received by the Tabin. So in the age of Tabin, means Tabin and Tabai Tabin are alive, you have this textualization. From that age is your first graph, which shows Imam Malik up to Imam Ozai. That was the first massive topical collections. Like I told you, when they had that textualization effort, then that opened the door for people who were trying to do forgery and fabrication. So immediately after that, in the next generation, and again, a generation lasts about 30 years. So if you see the next group, it is the second generation. What are they? That's of the Hadith critics. All right? So their dates of birth are roughly in the 120s, 118, 120, 135, etc. All right? Then what they did is they did this spread out effort of trying to evaluate all the different narrators. Now, there are not that many narrators at this time, keep in mind, because all the Sahaba are Udul. They're all viewed as reliable narrators. So basically what they're doing is they're just narrating few Tabin and Tabai Tabin, because I showed inside yesterday, 19 Sahaba narrated 89% of Hadith. And just like that, it was their specialist students in the Tabin, and onward their specialist students in the Tabai Tabin. So it's not like you have hundreds of thousands of narrators. It's a finite group of people who are the narrators at their time, all right? Now, they basically started commenting and writing and, and catching, and I showed you a bit yesterday of some comparative method, cross-analysis, all right? Now, because they were just writing as individuals, the next generation, which are called the encyclopedia critics, that's just a term being given to them because what they did was try to gather all of the evaluations of narrators done by Yahud bin Sayyid, Rimut Allah, and Abdul bin Malik, and others into in compiled forms, right? So that now there could be reference works, compiled reference works, containing all the comments and evaluations of that early generation of Hadith critics on all the narrators of the Tabin and Tabai Tabin. This is a finite work. Finite number of narrators in Tabin, finite in Tabai Tabin. So don't think it's so unwieldy. Right now Hadith is unwieldy. I'll show you that. 
At that time, it wasn't as unwieldy as people think it is. It's a finite task. And these people were brilliant scholars who dedicate their entire lives to this effort. All right? Finite task, discrete task, done. Now what happened was, once these encyclopedia critics did their work, then there was the second phase of textualization. The second phase of textualization is now we will take all of this into account. And that is why the books that were compiled after this are given a special status. They are called the Seha Sitta, and there are other works as well. Some of the more authentic works after this, such as the Sharimani Al-Athar of Imam Abu Jafar Tahawi Rimlatala, is actually more higher rated than Ibn Majah, uh, equal to Tirmidhi and Nasain Ibn Daud in terms of its rating. All right? But because he was even later than them, so he wasn't part of this quote-unquote six books canon. All right? Then you have other compilers, and there are various reasons why they will compile hadith, but it basically ends by the time the textual corpus ends by the time of Imam Behaqir Imam who lived in the 400s. And after that, that's it. What does that mean? That yes, there's still oral transmission of hadith, but you must always refer back to one of the textual compilations. Where in the generation of Tabi'in, you're orally narrating hadith, you don't have to refer to some textual compilation. Because nobody today can quote a hadith to you orally, orally narrated to you, unless it is a narration that is present in the textual compilations. Right? Now if I tell you that Imam Bihaqi is the end and he's in the 400s Hijri, and by the way he adds maybe 0.01% to the textual corpus, the real end is roughly 350. So you're saying 1100 years ago, the textual corpus of Hadith and its tags and gratings were sealed, and all the Muhaddithin have never felt the need to touch it again, except like I told you a few individuals who I mentioned to you yesterday. All right? So this was to clarify this issue. Just to review yesterday very quickly, I explained that there were hadith that are mutawatir, mashur, and khabar wahid. And then the next categorization, which is sahih as and zayf, only comes in the khabar wahid. All right? Sahih means that all of the narrators were adil, were just at flawless memory and have a continuous chain. Hasan means that all of the above, but there may be one narrator who had slightly less than flawless memory. By the way, the gradings of the hadith means slightly less means Sahih means they're all A+, plus, and Hassan means they're all A+, plus in terms of their being adil, just upright, pious, practicing believers. They're all A+, plus in terms of the chain is continuous, but one narrator's memory is A instead of A+. Plus. That's how I would to give you the feel of what it is. It doesn't mean one narrator is a D. One narrator is an A, except an A+. Plus. All right? Zayf means that there is one narrator, or if it's very zayf, there's more than one narrator, that is getting like a B or a C on some of the grading criteria, right? And the grading criteria is more than this. Again, this is simplification, drop in the ocean, introduction behind the scenes tour, only to be left again back at the exit. All right. Now, why don't we only take say hadith and leave out the zayf? So I explained this to you yesterday as well. Zayf hadith are authentic hadith. So the first classification is authentic and inauthentic. Inauthentic is called mawdu'ah. Zayf means that hadith that all the muhaddithin viewed as authentically transmitted by the Prophet ﷺ and part of the sunnah. However, they tagged it with Zayf because there was one narrator who had a B or a C on one of their grading criteria. Alright? For example, if I told you that this person is an IBA graduate, but I will tag and let you know that he's a 2.5 GPA. You need to know that also. But he is a graduate as opposed to somebody else who is a dropout. <laughs> so there's a big difference. You ask the dropout and the IBA graduate with a 2.5, they'll say there's a huge difference between us. And the 2.5 will say, don't treat me like a dropout, because I have a 2.5 GPA. Right? Here, mashallah, I'm sure you guys are better than that. Right? Yeah. So don't treat a Zayf Hadith like a dropout. Don't treat it like a mawdu. Don't drop it out, take it out of the sunnah. No muhaddith ever did that in history. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taala, Ibn Qayyim al Juzi have never argued for that in any of their works. But the popular speakers, they teach you this. Alright? Okay. Now, what is the use of a Zayf Hadith? Now, Hadith now coming to Islamic law. Islamic law is about for when and how you can use Hadith. Alright? Okay. Mutawatir hadith can be used for anything, any Islamic law. If you want to drive a fard, learn that something's haram, mutawatir hadith has enough source proof to do that. 
A mashur hadith also has enough source proof to do that. A khabar wahid hadith that is sahih also has enough source proof to do that. And a khabar wahid hadith that is hasan also have enough source proof to do that. If you weren't here yesterday, you may not be able to understand everything I'm saying today. That's just the way it is. Alright? A khabar wahid that is zayf. Now, there are extra criteria before you can use it in Islamic law. Imam Munifarim Allah Ta'ala made about seven such extra criteria. Alright? Okay. So, it doesn't mean it's forged, but it's not certain. It's what we call highly probable, very plausible. Highly plausible, very probable. That's probably better. Highly plausible, very probable. So therefore, we can use it in Islamic law if we can find several other things. And there's a whole range of things. One is corroboration. One is, like I told you, the concept of Tawatara Manavi. So we can also get Sahih Manavi. What does it mean that this hadith is Zaif, but this meaning is found exactly somewhere else in a Sahih hadith? I did that for you the other day about the companions being stars. So when we know that the Prophet said, Asabik and Najum, so actually with those words, every chain is Zaif. But with the exact same meaning, we have a sayyidith. So that's corroboration in meaning, not corroboration in words. And that will make us elevate the hadith from zayf to a higher level. Okay, that would be called hasan ghayrihi. But again, that's too much detail for you right now. All right. This I explained to you yesterday also that Imam Bukhari and also used zayf hadith in other of his works. And he also used it in the sahih in the chapter titles. I explained to you that neither Imam Bukhari nor Imam Muslim made any claim and their written works testified to this also that they were not trying to include all the sahih hadith in their work. Therefore, this number one debunks the myth that Islamic law, fiqh, sharia can only be derived from Quran and Bukhari and Muslim. No. Second, this debunks the claim that Islamic law and Sharia can only be derived from Quran and Sahih Hadith. No, because Hassan Hadith and Zayf Hadith, if they meet certain conditions, will be used. All right? Okay. Then I very quickly mentioned to you about the Sunan of Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi and Nasain ibn Majah. So if you were here, you would remember that. And if you don't, you wouldn't remember that. All right. Two best kept secrets. Now, it's not that I've kept them secret from you. There are others who've kept them secret from you. I'm about to tell you. Right? Number one is that how... I'm giving you two of several ways that is AFD can be elevated. One is that multiple chains of corroboration that I did for you when I made the chains for you yesterday. Yemen, Baghdad, Damascus, Makkah, Makkah, Din, Manwa. The second is use of an early jur... Use by an early jurist of that hadith prior to the advent of the weak narrator. Now understand this, Imam Munifa, now look at me very carefully because I can't explain this in the PowerPoint, right? We are, Imam Munifa was from the Tabin. Imam Malik was from the Tabai Tabin. So you can find that Imam Malik issued the legal opinion based on this hadith. So let's say the hadith is XYZ. Now you want to go search that hadith. Now where will you find the hadith today? You can't find it in the oral tradition. Imam Munifa got on the oral tradition. You will look for it in the textual compilation. In the textual compilation, their narrators after Imam Bunifa. So the narrators after the time of the Tabin. So you say, I researched this hadith and I found that XYZ is only found in one textual compilation. And it's only found, for example, in the Jami of Imam Tirmidhi. Jami of Imam Tirmidhi, who is 140 years, 100 year, 120 years, uh, dies 120 years after Imam Bunifa. Right? So how did he narrate his chain? He's got people in the chain of the hadith that reached him after Imam Anifa. And then one of the critics called one of those narrators weak. So you would say, well look, and, you, and, and an argument person will make for this, all factually correct. Statement one, this hadith that Imam, Imam Anifa based the legal ruling on this hadith. Fact. This hadith can only be found in the textual compilation of Imam Tirmidhi. Fact. Imam Tirmidhi viewed this, labeled this hadith as zif. Fact. No hadith scholar disagrees with Imam Tirmidhi in his grading of the hadith. Fact. All hadith scholars unanimously viewed as zif. Fact. The Hanafis still use it anyway. Fact. They do it because they prefer Imam Nifa over the Prophet. Lie. <laughs> Lie. Why do the Hanafis still use it anyway? Because Imam Tirmidhi and all the hadith scholars called this hadith zif. Because the chain of narrators in the text has a narrator after Imam Nifa's time who is weak. So it reads them through a C-grade narrator. 
that C grade narrator lives after Imam Munifa, to Imam Munifa having that same text in his work, and because his work is a book of fiqh, the works that his students wrote, Imam Mamsir Shaybani, is a work of fiqh, it doesn't mention Sanad in that. But clearly the same text was there, without that narrator, that narrator wasn't even born yet, so that means that that narrator is irrelevant to this hadith. It's a bit hard for you to understand, so I simply put this, that the use, by, use of that hadith by an early jurist, and you have that use textually documented in their books of fiqh, prior to that weak narrator, means this hadith is not zayf. So in this case, Imam Manifa's legal rulings are in the writings of one of his students, whose name is Imam Muhammad ibn Asin Shibani, who himself was a great hadith scholar, who himself was the teacher of Imam Shafi, Ta'ala, and was himself the student of Imam Malik, Ta'ala, and the student of Imam Manifa. Student of two and teacher of one. He mentions Imam Nifa basis ruling on this hadith. That's where you got fact number one. You got that from his works. <laughs> and the hadith text is exactly as it is. But you should have realized that he wrote that even before there was that weak narrator. Do you understand? Right? I could stand up and do it for you in a demonstration, but that would take too much time. Alright? This is one of the best kept secrets from you. Right? This is why you have to trust the tradition. <laughs> you have to trust it or you have to know it. It's so easy to mislead. You know, one of my, my teachers, he explained it beautifully. He said, how is it, how easy is it, is it to break a light bulb? He says, one second. How much effort does it take to build the factory that can manufacture a single light bulb? It's a huge effort. <laughs> so what they do is they just quote things at you and they're just breaking the light bulb. And you have no, it's easy. It's very easy. I could do it for you. If you, if, if you want me to, things that you think are okay, I can trick you. You, you pick, not any ruling, but there will be a whole bunch of rulings that you think are okay. I will dig it up and show you a zif hadith about that ruling. But that would be fraud, because actually the hadith isn't zif. There are many other factors there, right? This wasn't the only one thing. Again, it's the workshop. So the workshop of hadith is, I need to find all the mention of that hadith in the textual tradition of these scholars and the early fic texts that predate those textual compilations, not the later ones, the early fic texts and all of the a'imma of the madhahib arba'a, Imam Munifa, his fic rulings are found in the text of his students, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad and Shabani, they also precede these six collections. Imam Shafi's own work, Kitab al and others precede these six collections. Right? Imam Malik's work, Mu'atta and others precede these six collections. So I have to look for that hadith also in the early works of fiqh. That, that's part of the workshop, right? This is a huge workshop in hadith. And I told you about every single narrator. There's so many critics here to put all that in the workshop. Every muhaddith, later medieval and late medieval commentator like Ibn Hajj al-Skalani, I'll give you another example. There's a place in the Sahih of Bukhari, which is not a hadith, but one sahabi says that when the Apostle told us to straighten the rows for prayer, he I, he said, the Sahabi, that me and my friends, we joined our ankles feet to feet. This is how we understood it. Right? Okay, Imam Bukhari also adds his understanding. Ibn Hazr Skalani, who's commenting on that, that's another slide I should have given you, but didn't, how much can, it takes a lot of time to put these things in English, do it for you. Right? Uh, Ibn Hazr Skalani that says, no one has ever done amal on this. No one has ever done amal on this and we leave it. Imam Malik in his Muatta, narrates hadith and says, I leave it. Now this is another thing to show you. The fuqaha leave hadith. You're stunned. <laughs> right? This is what you've been shown. They do it knowingly. They do it deliberately. Why? Because it's amongst the conflicting evidences now in the workshop. So there's some other evidence that they prefer and select over that hadith. So they leave amal on that hadith. I gave you one example in the Sari of Imam Muslim. He says, no, I believe that hadith is sahih. The Sayyidina Abu Hurairah narrates that the Prophet said that when the Imam recites, be silent, I believe it's Sahih. But I don't include everything that's Sahih in my book. Why? Because I don't do Amal on that Hadith. So Imam Muslim did not do Amal on Sahih Hadith. Yes, 100%. Imam Shafi did not do Amal on Sahih Hadith. Yes, there's certain Sahih Hadith that Imam Shafi did not do Amal on. Certain Sahih Hadith that Imam Malik did not do Amal on. Certain Sahih Hadith that Imam Nifa didn't do Amal on. Certain Sahih Hadith that Imam Ahmed bin is the least though, because Imam Ahmed is actually more of a muhaddith than a faqih. His mother is every Hadith. He says, my mother is Hadith. Sometimes he has four positions on something, because they're all four Hadiths. He says, I won't decide. This was his approach. 
I won't select on the basis of preference. That's why there are very few hanbali muftis and qazis in history. Because like I told you, you have to select. How are you going to get the fatwa? You're going to give the person four fatwas. Four fatwas. You are married. You are, have only one divorce. You have two divorces. And all three have taken. Right? Hey, 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 hey. Right? <laughs> so that's why hanbali Imam Ahmad Abdullah had a fiqh. But his fiqh was basically hadith. And that couldn't be used basically for iftah and qada. That's why it's the most minority madhab in the history of Islam. Alright? Even today, there was a Yemeni once, a scholar who told me this, right, and a very reliable person, that the Yemeni courts, although strictly they follow Shafi and Hanbali fiqh, and so many things we have to use Hanafi fiqh. And he wasn't saying it happily, he wasn't saying upset, he just a matter of factly, because the Hanafi fiqh is the most developed in terms of court law, case law, precedent, usul, zawabit, kuliyat, yeah, that type of thing, right? Uh, and a Sudan, Sudanese scholar told me the same thing, right? Especially, and they were specifically talking about contract law, commercial law, things not, not salah, not where to hold your friends, right? You also have to understand, fiqh is so much more. Just few issues of difference are hammered home over and over again. And I have to clear it up with you. This is the problem. That there's an obsession with these issues in this English educated class of Pakistan. And a lot of our online listeners also in the US, UK, Canada, it's also there. It's like the only thing you know about fiqh is Rafia then or not and where to hold your hands or not. Fiqh is a huge world. The only thing you know about fiqh is should I do the lead or not and should I follow one mother or not. That's it. There's three questions you have. Where do I do with what is the physical things I should do in prayer? And do I have to follow one madhab? And do I have to do taqlid? That's it. You can't get beyond these three things. Right? It's like an obsession. It's because all these, all these false, bait, oversimplified presentations have been made to you. Alright? Okay. So there's a lot, a lot that goes into the use of hadith by a jurist. One thing I wanted to show you, it's here, but now I'm because I'm going at speed, I may not be able to find it myself. Imam At-Tirmidhi in his own jami, he said, Al-Fuqahu a'lamu bima'ani al-ahadith. Imam Tirmidhi. Now who's Imam Tirmidhi? I have to, here it is, inside 26 of Hadith Old. Unfortunately, they didn't write in Arabic. Al-Fuqahu a'lamu bima'ani al-ahadith. What does this mean? I've highlighted a few there. Imam Tirmidhi is Imam Bukhari's greatest student. In the world of Muhaddithin, Imam Bukhari, but in the view of some, is Amir al-Muhaddithin, the single greatest Muhaddith ever. His single greatest student is Imam Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi wrote, and the jurists know better about the meanings of Hadith. Our job is the narrations and the narrators and the textual variations. Where has this word appeared? Where is this word missing? Where is this an extra sentence? Where is it missing? The jurists know about the meanings. And that's why in his work, the student of Imam Bukhari, he didn't agree with his teacher's method. He didn't, therefore he didn't compile a sahih. And what he did was after every hadith, he mentioned the positions of the jurists. Now for example, for the Hanafi position, he would mention the position of Abdullah ibn Mubarak, because he was a student of the student of Imam Nifri Matala. For Imam Shafi's, he would mention Imam Shafi's. He mentioned some other ones also, other than the four madahib uh, that you people are more aware of. Because he felt that, look, it's not my job as a muhaddith. If I'm going to mention a hadith in a chapter of law, and in a topic that is the subject of Islamic law, I am in duty bound to mention the positions of the jurists on it. This was the view of the greatest student of Imam Bukhari. The greatest alim of Bukhari is viewed as Ibn Hajar Skalani. He was 100% muqallid of the Shafi madhab. The greatest alim of Sahih Muslim, his name was Imam al nawi He's a hundred percent muqallid of the Shafi madhab. This historical fact, no scholar can deny this. So you have great hadith scholars. Now these early hadith scholars, Imam Bukhari, like I told you, had his own legal views. He was a jurist in his own right. All the rest of them were taqlid of, doing taqlid of some madhab or the other. And the later muhaddithin are even more, you know, Imam al bihqi who's quoted so often by the Salafis, is as a hardcore Shafi. If you want to talk about you in order, you call it Qatar Shafi. Hardcore. <laughs> right? Hardcore. And I told you, he's the end. Khatam. Khatam al muhaddithin He's viewed as the end of that great er, first phase of Hadith scholars. Right? So, the takli uh, the Mufassirun. Imam al-Tabri had his own mother. He was a mushtahid level imam. 
Ibn Kathir was Shafi. Some say he's Hanbali. Bara, he was Muqallid. Al-Qutubi was 100% Maliki. These great Mufassirun also did Taqlid. These are historical facts that nobody can, there's no difference of opinion on this. That no, 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 they claimed that they did Taqlid, I found they didn't. These people write it themselves, many of them. Alright? This is a very important point for you to remember. Now, alright. So now I want you to understand, answer to question number one. Do I always then have to resort to fiqh? You've made it sound so complicated. Workshops and knobs and boxes and scholars and ulama. So what does it mean? I'm never supposed to even like touch the Quran and Hadith? No, no, no. There's two things I told you before. Number one is that you have your own spiritual relationship. And number two, you will get your own level of guidance because there's only 600 ayat of ahkam in Quran. 90% of the Quran is not even a subject matter of fiqh. Right? So you don't need to be a faqih a jurist to understand that, right? And actually, contrary to the, a lot of hadith aren't actually about Islamic law. Unfortunately, the way they're taught, because rather than being taught as sunnah, they're taught as textbooks for Islamic legal debates between people. So you have an over, overly legalized concept. For example, Ibn Hajj al-Skalani, he was a hardcore Shafi, so he decided to make a pure textbook for Shafi positions called Bulugh al-Maram. And certain Salafi scholars this is the very first book they teach in Hadith. This is not the book to teach in Hadith. This is this is this is the book he made for Shafi jurists to keep by their side, right? For the popular person, you should be reading Rada Salihin. I can't even believe somebody would teach Bulugh al-Maram. Rada Salihin is also Imam Ram, He's also Shafi, but it's a work of Hadith. What does it mean? It all, that's also a work of Hadith. It means a work of Sunnah. And Ra'ad al-Salihin, Imam al nawi is trying to give you a representative sample of all the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ on the topics of sunnah. So you get the sunnah guidance. You should read Ra'ad al-Salihin. But they want to teach you Bulug al-Maram. That's not a book designed by Ibn Hajar, the compiler, to give a person an overview of sunnah. That's not his purpose in compiling that work. That is a hadith compilation only to give the exclusively Shafi evidences in hadith. For the fiqh of prayer and for other things. So it doesn't make a sense. Why would you teach a lay person Bulugh al-Maram? Unless you're trying to indoctrinate them in a very specific methodology. Right? Alright? So Riyadh al-Salihin is the place to go if you want to say, no, I want to learn hadith because I want to hear what, how my Prophet has guided me how to live my life. May Allah Ta'ala reward Imam Manawri Allah Ta'ala tremendously for compiling a work of hadith for you. This is what you say, that where's the work of Hadith for the layman? It's there. When if you ever finish that completely, you come to me, I'll tell you what to do next. First things first. Begin at the beginning. First things first. Begin at the beginning. As far as Quran goes, you should try to understand the translation of Quran. That's called Fahim. Fahim. So one is Fahim. One is Ilm. And one is Tafakku. Fahim means, okay, I have a basic, basic, non-scholarly understanding. Right? Like Allah said, Allah didn't ya'lamun, but they didn't la ya'lamun. La ya'lamun doesn't mean they're ignorant. They have a fahim of deen, obviously. Allah is not categorizing them as absolutely ignorant people. No. It just means scholarly believers and non-scholarly believers. The non-scholar believer must have fahim of his deen. Right? Alright? So fahim of the Quran and your beginning of fahim of hadith is rather salin of Imam No. That's not the, but, that has been, it's not just me personally saying this. For about the past 700 years in the Islamic tradition, this was the beginning was in Riyadh the salihin And our mother says the beginning and third year they start with Riyadh the salihin First years are mostly spent learning Arabic, right? And doing short collections of Hadith. But that's also just to build your Hadith vocabulary. When they really start studying Hadith, they go to Riyadh the salihin We don't start teaching them some Hanifi manual of Hadith evidences for Hanifi prayer. We start with Riyadh al-Salihin. Learn what the Prophet told you. Get your basic fam of the Sunnah. Alright? Okay. Now what happens is, I want you to look at this. So this is the new PowerPoint slide number 5. Sources of Sharia. So the textual sources of the textual sources there too is called Nusus Shari. The textual sources are Ayat Qur'aniya and Ahaditha, Nabawiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's only two textual sources of Sharia. Alright, now whenever you're looking for a legal matter, a legal ruling, hukm shari on something, is it permissible, prohibited, 
commanded, preferred, or disliked. There are five categories. I did that for you before. So either you will find it mentioned in the textual sources or you won't. Things, for example, you won't. So somebody says, oh, I have a corporate job and my company deposits a provident fund for me or IRA account for me. Do I have to pay zakat on it? You won't find that answer in a text of Quran. Text. You you have to drive it from the meanings and the principles, but you won't find the answer in the text of Quran or the text of Hadith. Somebody asks you the question that me and my wife, we can't conceive. Can I go for assisted reproduction? In vitro fertilization, test your baby. You won't find the answer to that question in a text, in a text of verse or a text of Hadith. Alright? So there are some things that are not mentioned textually. Alright? You, you're going to understand why I keep saying this to you. Second option is you find it mentioned. You find it mentioned. For example, you want to know, do I have to go for Hajj? There's mention of that. Right? What is required to get married? So what is it? I need two witnesses. I need meher. I need four witnesses. I need no meher. You, that's there. That's textually there. That's in the text. So you'll find it mentioned. When you find it mentioned, then there are two possibilities. He's saying that you need a woman to get married. Huh? And that's not found in the text, but he says, I know that intuitively. Right? That's part of my fitra. That's part of that fitra part you told me Allah Ta'ala gave me. Huh? Allah Akbar. If you whisper, you get caught. <laughs> if you whisper in the first row, subhanAllah. Huh? 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 Alright, so you find mention of it. Now, either you find mention of it in one text, or you find it in multiple texts. Maybe it's just one hadith on this topic. That's it. Like I gave the example, one third. You can leave with see of one third. That hadith that Maaf the Karzaman did his PhD on. There's one fourteen chains, but the text is one. The text is one. That's it. Right? Okay, now if you find it in one, either that one text has one meaning, or that one text has multiple meanings. So for example, in that case, that one text has one meaning. The Muslims said clearly, you cannot leave more than one third as wasiyah. There's no scope for interpretation. You can't turn the knob on that. Well, by one third, the apostle meant, you know, roughly one third. You know, the desi uncle mentality. Right? Yeah. That's the way people talk in this country. Right? I, I'm too embarrassed to translate that to our English speaking audience. They'll be stunned. <laughs> that this is the attitude people take towards Sharia. Yeah, that's the attitude they take. A very light, lack, lackadaisical laid back. Alright? But you might find it in one, but that one text has multiple meanings. An example of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran. In Quran is mentioned a crime, it's called hiraba. And the punishment Allah ta'ala mentions, a unifal of ard, that you should know how you translate this word. So you can literally translate it, banish that person from the earth. Now what does it mean to banish a person? So those people who kept the knob at zero... They said, banish him from earth means wipe him off the face of the earth, means kill him. So they felt that when they were doing criminal law, they said the punishment for the crime called Hiraba, I'm not even going to tell you what Hiraba is, that also has multiple meanings. The punishment of the crime of Hiraba is capital punishment. Second, that others said, no, to banish him from earth, to banish that person from earth means take them out of Darul Islam, exile them. So this is the punishment, means exile. Third group said that banish from earth means take them out from public society, i.e. imprison them. So now you have one text. There's no other place which mentions what should be the punishment for Hiraba. One text. But that has multiple meanings. Multiple meanings have been emerged. When you ran the workshop on that text, you saw multiple meanings. Now obviously it makes a big difference to the criminal standing there. Are you going to kill him? Are you going to exile him? Or are you going to imprison him? Hmm? It can make a big difference. Right? Okay? All right. The second option is, if you look back at this slide, you find mention of this matter in the textual sources, but not in one text, in multiple texts. So there's several hadith on it, several oh, ayat of Qur'an on it. Okay. Now, another option here is that those multiple texts have one meaning. They all say the same thing. There's multiple texts, but they all say the same thing. The other option is that there's multiple texts and they all have multiple meanings. They lead you to multiple meanings, such as those issues of hadith. So just like Imam Muslim showed you, there were multiple sahih hadith. One that when the Imam is reciting, be silent. And the other is when the Imam is reciting, keep reciting. So you found it. Question, should I recite when I pray salah behind an Imam? Found it in the text. Found mention in it. Found it in multiple texts. I found it in multiple texts. And those multiple texts had multiple meanings. 
So when you have the multiple texts that have multiple meanings, there's another step you can do. Do you know which text came last chronologically? If you happen to know that, and you won't always necessarily be able to figure that out. If you know that, then the later one is what is the, you will follow the meaning indicated by the later one, and you will leave the meaning indicated by the earlier one, even though the earlier one is a sahih hadith. So one of the students pointed out, yesterday Imam Bukhari al-Tala is an example of a sahih hadith that nobody practices. So in the sahih of Imam Bukhari, he's narrated a date that the Prophet used to do, Rafi'a then raised his hand between the two sajdas. Between the two sajdas, no Sunni jurist did amal on this hadith. No Sunni jurist based their fiqh on amal on this hadith. Alright, because that was viewed as something that was done in the early period and we find all the later reports and the reports that the Prophet did not do this are later. So when you know which comes later, you do, you practice the meaning of the later text and you leave the earlier text. But you don't delete it from the Hadith Corpus, you leave it there. Because the Prophet said it. We're not going to do historical inaccuracy. We won't delete it from the Sahih of Bukhari. We're not going to print a new edition of Bukhari and delete that. It's still there. It's still there. Alright? And the other option is you don't know. So you found it mentioned in the textual sources, but you found it in multiple verses in Hadith. They all had multiple meanings, and you don't know which one came later. Right? Okay. Now, basically, the purple, you don't need thick in the purple. So if you find it, and it's only in one text, and it has one meaning, you don't need mufti, you don't need faqih. You might need the mufti as an alim, he'll help you find it, but otherwise you don't need him to give you the ruling. The ruling is to be derived directly from the text. It's not even derived, the ruling is mentioned in the text. There's no actually derivation process. The ruling is in the text, right? But that said, not every non you don't. It's not like you guys know all these texts, right? This is also called the enterprise, but the point is you don't need the activity of fiqh, usul, madhab, you don't need that. Similarly, if you find it in multiple hadith, and all those multiple hadiths say one meaning, you don't need fiqh, usul, and madhab. Similarly, if you know definitively which one came later, you leave the earlier one, you follow the later one, you don't need fiqh, usul, and madhab. However, if number one, you don't even find it in the first place, believe me, you need fiqh, usul, and madhab. If a person says, I only follow Quran and hadith, I say, okay, tell me, can she have a test tube baby or not? Answer the question. Person says, I only believe in Sahih Bukhari. Okay, answer the question from Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Answer it. Right? So if you don't find it, you definitely need, I'm going to tell you what fiqh, usul, and madhab is. That's coming next. I'm creating the scope. So there's no claim that fiqh, usul, and madhab is for everything. No. It has a scope. It has a particular scope of application. Alright? If you find that shari'i matter mentioned in one text, but that one text has multiple meanings, again, you're going to need fiqh to figure out which meaning will you prefer and elevate and select to be the basis of your amal or your fatwa or your court ruling. Similarly, if you find mention of it in multiple texts, those multiple texts have meaning, you don't know which one came later, you will need fiqh. So let me give you some verbal examples of this. So let's take your favorite examples because people are obsessed with this issue. Must I raise my hands after coming up from ruku or not? Allah <laughs> Kabira. Right? Okay. So, where would this fall in this? It falls in the bottom right corner. You found it in the text. You found multiple texts. Those multiple texts had multiple meanings. Not even multiple that outright contradict each other. One says no, one says yes. Both are sahih. Right? So, what are you going to do? You need fiqh. Now, to give you an example, what is fiqh? So fiqh means the jurists, they were sitting there with this hadith. They were, they, the jurists are the ones who built the workshop and who lived in the workshop. The muhaddithin didn't even build the workshop. The muhaddithin tagged the workshop. That's why you guys are mistaken. You think, well, the hadith were compiled later, the fiqh came first, it doesn't make sense. Weren't the jurists using the hadith? Shouldn't have hadith been compiled first and the mother should have been later? No. The jurists built the workshop. They were the ones they were the ones who even categorized hadith into these are on nikah, these are on talaq. Imam Bukhari and Muhammad, they just took all of that. The proof is Imam Malik's muatta. The workshop is already there. The Muslim Imam Ahmad, the workshop is there. They just tagged it and rearranged it. They didn't build it. The jurists are the one who built the workshop and they lived in the workshop and they were the ones who were trying to identify Allah Ta'ala's will and wish from the workshop. 
The Mahadisin aren't even doing that. They're not trying to identify Allah Ta'ala's will and wish from the workshop. They're just interested in tagging and rearranging and structuring that workshop. Alright? Okay. So, how do they do this? So, usul means that you have to pick some principle to navigate this multiplicity. So, I'll give you a real example. When you have this case of multiplicity, where you're talking about multiple hadith, and it's not a question of their authenticity, they're both equally authentic. So what do you do? So Imam Abu Manifa and Imam Shafi adopted different usul. Imam Shafi, Rimla Ta'ala, took the principle that I will prefer those texts that have a greater number of narrations. Greater number of narrations. So for example, if I find that there are seven texts that say the Prophet did Rafiya Dan, raised his hands, and I find five that say he didn't, well, that's it for me. This is my basis of preference. I will select on this basis, greater number of narrations, that set of texts that said he did it, and I will make that my understanding of how a person should pray. All right? Completely valid. Imam Muni Frantai says, what? That I will look at seniority of narrators. I will go back and see who are the Sahaba who originally narrated this. And if I find that the, it, whatever it is, I won't look at the number. It might be sometimes less, might be more. I look at seniority of narrators. So if I find, for example, say, Na'umar, Ratanu, who are from Khulafa Rashidun, or from those Sahaba of those 19 who narrated most hadith, or from what who, the jurist viewer, they call them the Fuqahai Sahaba, or the Fuqahai Medina from the Tabin. If I find them, if I find that the narrators are more senior, I will go with that text based on seniority of narrators. So what's the difference? Number of narration, that was one principle, number of narrations, and the second principle was seniority of narrators. This is called usul. Without usul, you cannot solve this issue. There is no non usul way to solve this issue. This is a myth, no. This is a myth that has been told that no, you pick what has a sahih and you leave what has a zayf hadith. That's a myth. They both have sahih hadith. <laughs> There's sahih hadith on both sides. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's, if, that's, doesn't help us at all. That's, that's a ploy. <laughs> that, you can only say that if you don't show somebody the other sahih hadith. And that's what they do. <laughs> that's what they do. This whole thing, show me the hadith, show me the hadith, is a strange, <laughs> strange mutalaba to make. Because the decision isn't based on one single hadith. That if I show you one single hadith, you can decide. One single hadith is plucking out one text from out of the workshop. The decision is going to be made on that. The question is, show me the understanding. Show me the fiqh. Show me the understanding of the workshop that is the basis of this ruling. You can't say, show me the single hadith from the workshop that is the basis of the ruling. The single hadith can never be the basis of the ruling. As far as textual sources go, the whole workshop is the basis of the ruling. So this notion, show me the hadith, show me, it's, it's ludicrous. To publish pamphlets like this, that this is how to pray, because I can show you one, one, one hadith for these positions, yeah, you can find one. I'll give you a pamphlet. <laughs> you will never see anybody pray like that. For example, I'll make them do rafiyah then between sadhas. I'll give the hadith. I'll, I'll give you a pamphlet with all types of ways of praying that you've never seen, and I'll give you one, one hadith for each one. One hadith is not sufficient. You understand? Alright? Okay. So there's one example of usul. All right. All right. So what I was telling you is fahm ilm and tafakku. All right. Fahm ilm and tafakku. Now understand the history, a little bit of this history. There was more than just these four originally. Different people, historians have estimated them differently, but you're talking about roughly between 10 and 20. 10 and 20, what master class jurists? They're known as mujtahid. Mujtahid, master class jurists. What does a master class jurist mean? Understand it, it has a meaning. It means that person who can identify and derive usul directly from the Quran Hadith. Not rulings, usul. That's called a mujtahid. Who can identify and derive principles directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. So there is an example I sometimes give. It's a very long example. If I do it, you will enjoy it. Okay, I don't know about that. If I do it, I will enjoy it. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Right? Listen carefully. I'm going to show you a position in Islamic law. 
where all four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafani, and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal took a different position. And I'm going to give you the behind the scenes tour and why they took that different position. And then you decide. Can there only be one? You will decide. Alright. So the question. What is the question? So the question was this. That it's time to pray. Let's say it's Salatul Asr. And the person who needs to pray, it's farther on them now. As soon as the time of Asr come, enters, it's farther on that person to pray. But that person does not have wudu. And although being perfectly healthy and able to use water, there is no water anywhere near them. Now there is different rulings of jurists that, okay, there's a certain time they can keep traveling, searching for water, what effort they have to make to find the water. Otherwise, the backup is they can make something called tayammum. Tayammum. Right? Which is to use some pure earth-like substance. Earth-like substance means that which does not burn in fire. So it might be brick, might be clay, might be soil, might be sand. Alright? Okay. But just so happens, the time is running out. He's got, you know, sunset is about to come. And he can't find that either. He can't find any, or she can't find any pure earth-like substance either. So the case is this, that look, what am I supposed to do? I can't make wudu, no water. I can't make the amum, I can't find any of that material. And the time for Maghrib is about to come, time for Asr is about to end. What should I do? Alright. Now there are four possible answers to this question. Again, logically there are only four answers. The four answers are as follows. Number one is pray anyway. Go ahead and pray. So I'm going to call that pray now. Pray now, before the time ends. Pray now. This is called Ada, Ada in Arabic. Second option is, okay, look, now you can't pray because you're not, you're not tahara. You don't have the condition for prayer. So you'll have to pray later whenever you get access to water or something to make tiyamam, even if that, so the time will expire, so you will pray kada. Okay? Pray later. Pray now, pray later. Third option is do both. That could also be a ruling. That you should pray now without tahara. And later, as soon as you get access to water, even the time it passed, you should make it up. You should make it up. Okay, because you prayed without a state of purity. So do both Ada and Kaza. Pray now and pray later. Alright? Everybody got this so far? Fourth option was do nothing. Logically speaking, for neither pray now nor pray later. There can only be four answers to this question. Right? And the people are happy. That's, that's my kind of fiqh. That's my type of ijtihad. Don't have to do Ada and don't have to do Kaza. <laughs> which, which, which one said that? Today I finally found out how to decide which mother I'm going to follow. Huh? Allah Akbar? SubhanAllah? Yeah. So I'll start with that. Who said that? Imam Malik Rehimullah Ta'ala. Imam Malik Rehimullah Ta'ala said, don't pray now and no need to pray later. Don't pray now. Why? He said because I'm not a hafiz, so I won't be able to 100% do it for you that well, because I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now. But basically, ah, إِذَا كُمْتُمْ إِلَى salati. So there's a verse uh, in Quran about wudu, alright? Which establishes that tahara is the condition for salah. Shart. So Imam Munib Malik says, look, you can't pray now, because you don't fulfill the shart, you don't fulfill the condition. So you can't pray now. Okay? So why shouldn't I pray later? says, you don't pray later because la, he takes a principle from Quran, deriving principles from Quran. Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha. That Allah Ta'ala has not made a person morally responsible for that which was not in his ability. This is an exceptional circumstance where you were actually, it was not in your ability to pray. It's not like you didn't pray because of laziness or because of sleep that you have to make it up kaza later. It was not in your ability to pray. So the responsibility of prayer was lifted from you. You are not mukallaf of that day's asr salah. You can't pray it right there and then because you don't fulfill the shart, the condition of ta'ala. So don't pray now. And no need to pray it later because you only make up later that prayer that you could have done on time. You couldn't do this on time. You're not mukallaf to make it up. So don't pray now. Don't pray later. Don't do Ada, don't do Qadha, Imam Malik, Rehmullah Ta'ala. This is called Ijtihad. On a principle. He didn't get the ruling from the text. He took a principle. Alright? Okay. Next. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Rehmullah Ta'ala. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Rehmullah Ta'ala. What does he say? Imam Ahmed says, pray now. He said, pray now. Do you ask Imam Ahmed, where did you get this? He said, I derived it from Usul. 
So where did you get your principle? Same ayah. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسأها. Same ayah. What? That normally tahara is the shart of salah, and you must always pray salah with that condition. But due to no fault of your own, you could not fulfill that condition. You could neither make wudu nor tiyamum. So the shart was lifted. The condition of tahara was lifted. You're not mukallaf of that. It's not in your wasa. You're not able to obtain the condition of purity. So, la yukallifullah nafsun wasa. You're not liable for that. So pray now. And no need to make it up later because it was perfectly valid. Normally, salah won't be valid without tahara. But because you could not obtain tahara, it was not in your ability, you're not liable for that, so pray now and it's valid. And when you pray now and valid, there's no concept of making up later, so only pray now, don't pray later. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Rehim Allah Ta'ala. It's the hot. It's manjigay. These were giants. <laughs> How dare some 20th century popular speaker try to speak against these people? When they have no ability and they don't even claim that either. That they can make ijtihad and drive principles from the Quran and Sunnah. Jalloh, I think you are enjoying along with me. Huh? Alright? Third. Third. Now let's get tough on you. Third. Do both. Allah. Double. Huh? Pray now and pray later. Who said this? Imam al-Shafi'i rimullah ta'ala. Imam al-Shafi'i rimullah ta'ala. Why? There's no, 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 principle. Where did you get your principles? From Quran. This is another beautiful thing in this example. All the usul are also coming from Quran. Imam, Imam Shafi says, what? Okay. He says, what happens is basically this. Why do you have to pray? So the duty to pray falls upon you due to this verse of Quran in the Salata, uh, Kanat al Mu'mini Kitab Mokuta. That indeed the prayer has been mandated, written, prescribed for believers at set and appointed times. So as soon as the time for Asr started, this dropped on you. One command of Allah Ta'ala dropped on you. Pray. Now when that command dropped on you, and because you were not in a state of purity, the second command dropped on you, salati. When you stand for prayer, you must you should wash your face and your arms up to your elbows. You must wipe your heads and wash your feet. So that also dropped on you. And normally, and if you couldn't do that, the verse, I don't remember that, but the verse of Tiamum, if you didn't have ability or access to water, then that one dropped on you. Right? Either way, the obligation to have Tahara dropped on you. It says normally you fulfill these two things together within one prayer time. You will then obtain tahara and pray salah and respond to these two commands of Allah Ta'ala in one prayer time. He says, this is that unique situation that you can't respond to this command to obtain tahara either through wuzur tiyamam, through those two ayahs, because you don't have access. But you still have this one on you. So you must respond to this one now. Waqt maquta in the time. So you must pray now. At least to respond to the command of Allah Ta'ala, you must pray at the prescribed times. That you won't be able to do after Maghrib. So you pray now. Then later, means after the sun sets, whenever you happen to find water or a pure earth-like substance, then you follow this, you obey, you show your obedience to this command of Allah Ta'ala that was the condition of purity in prayer. So therefore you should pray now and pray later. Imam Shafir Ta'ala Ijtihad from Quran. Three so far. Who's left? Imam Abunif Farium Allah Ta'ala. No, Imam Munifay follows Zayfadis. He didn't follow Quran. Huh? Who are you going to follow? The Prophet or some or Imam Munifa? The, the, the people teach like this. They talk like this. They say, oh, they printed namaz Hanafi. We're going to print namaz Nabawi. They did it. And they, they talk to people like this. They show the books. You want to pray namaz Hanafi? You want to pray namaz Nabawi? Actually, man. Salat al-Nabawi, according to the Sula of Abunifa, this is actually Salat al-Nabawi, according to the Sula of Imam Shafi and Ibn Taymiyyah. <laughs> but you put the subtitle as the title and you took out the subtitle here, right? And you made it an emotional challenge for people. Alhamdulillah, Imam Abunifa also made his ijtihad from Qur'an. From Qur'an. Alright, what does he say? He says, I looked in Qur'an for a usul, because the ruling isn't there. So he found, I said, I found an usul. I found an usul. I don't need to derive an asul. I found an asul made by Allah Ta'ala. What? So I looked in Tahara. There's a verse of wudu. And then the verse of tiyamum. 
And the verse of Tiyamam says that if you're not able, it's not open, permission, it's for the person who cannot make wudu, they can make Tiyamam. So he says in the world of Tahara, there's an asal and there's a naib. There's the original intended thing, which is wudu, and then there's the backup, the substitute, if you can't have water, Tiyamam. So Allah Ta'ala teaching us a principle himself in Quran that first try to do what I originally want you to do, the asal. And if you can't do that, go to the backup, the naib. So in the world of tahara, the asal is wudu, the naib is tiyamum, the original is intended is wudu, the backup is tiyamum. If you can't do the original, do the backup. He says, and I see in the world of salah, the asal is to pray on time. Ada, <coughs> the asal is to pray on time. But if you can't pray on time, Allah Ta'ala out of His mercy made a backup called Qadha to make it up later. So He says the same thing I see in Tahara. If you can't do the Asl, you can't do Wudu, make the Ammum and your prayer will be fine. Same thing I'm going to apply Allah Ta'ala's principle of Asl and Naib in Salah. This person can't pray now because they don't fulfill the condition of Tahara. So they can't pray now, they couldn't do the asal, they couldn't do the originally intended thing, they couldn't do ada, so they should go to the backup, and they should pray later, they should make qadha. So Imam Anifa said what? Make qadha. Alright? Now we take a vote. How many of you think Imam Malik, now I can only take the vote of those men who are sitting in front of me, how many of you think Imam Malik was correct? Raise your hand. Alright, so we got seven people, eight people. Nine people. How many of you think that Imam, who did I do for you a second? Imam Ahmed bin Hamba, I was correct. Raise your hand. About roughly the same, seven, eight, nine, ten people. Yeah, I know what they're trying to do. I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. Don't try. I understood the first time there is. You understood the second time there is. Yeah, I'll explain, don't try. How many of you think Imam Shafi Ramta is correct? How many of you think Imam Munif Ramta is correct? How many of you think all four are correct? How many of you think you still don't know enough to answer this question? That's the real answer. The real answer is all four are correct. And the other real answer is you're not ready yet to answer this question. Remember tax policy? Remember? Experts? One hour presentation, tax policy one, two, and three, and I picked number three. They said, you're not ready to answer this question. But at least it was enough to show you there's something going on here. <laughs> there's something going on. <laughs> and there's much more on this one issue. I just gave you round one. There's much more. <laughs> there's more evidences on all four positions. I just gave you one, one round. Just showed you one, one principle from round one of this. That's all I showed you. There's more. <laughs> These were giants. This was mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was hidayah. This is part of our hidayah that Allah ta'ala gave this ummah, ulama, fuqaha. And I showed you the first day, لِيَتَفَقُّهُ فِي الدِّينَ Allah ta'ala mentions this as a specialist activity. And they will guide the others. The others will be guided by them. So to choose to be guided by fuqaha is sabit from Qur'an. I mean, if you use the word taklid to refer to that guidance and try to make it look negative, that's a straw man argument. It is what it is. I'll show you from Sunnah. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sent one of his mujtahid faqeer sahabi Muad ibn Jabal to Yemen and told all sahaba you will do taklid of Muad ibn Jabal. So say taklid of shakhsi. Do I have to follow one? At least it's permissibility I can establish from sahih hadith. Sayyidina Rasulullah told all the Sahab of Yemen to follow one Mujtid Faqih, Sayyidina Muad ibn Jabal. Radiallahu ta'ala. Anhu. Those of you who are more familiar with this would know about this hadith. I told you the next version, Sayyidina Ali, Khulafai al Shudun, I'm one of them. He told all of Basra to follow Hassan al Basri. So to do taqlid of one scholar is established from Quran and Sahih hadith. What are you talking about? From the Sahih hadith, from the Amal of Sahaba. To do taqlid of Fuqaha scholars established from Quran. To choose to do taqlid of one faqih scholar established from Sahih Hadith and the Amal of the Khulafai Rashidun Sahaba. What more do you want? <laughs> what more am I supposed to tell you? Okay, next question. Why can't we mix and match and choose and decide? Because you said all four are correct. All four are correct. Okay. So, first I will tell you, it's not haram to mix and match. It's not fard to follow one mother. If I give you a fatwa, I can't say it's fard. It's viewed as highly recommended. 
to follow one. Number point one. Point two, there will be, there is a danger that when you mix and match and choose, you might end up in something haram. The mixing and matching and choosing itself isn't haram, but it might lead you to something that's haram. Alright, now let me open this up for you. Right? When you mix and match, what you're doing is you're not choosing rulings. Understand, it's all about usul. This is another thing you people, average people haven't understood. Fiqh is not about the rulings. It's about the principles behind those rulings. When you pick and choose and mix and match, you're not mixing and matching rulings. You're mixing and matching principles. So, like I told you maybe in one of the earlier days, or I told some of you guys when we sat, that Imam Ghazari Mulatala captured what the early jurists actually felt, which is there must be an internal logical coherence to fiqh, because fiqh ultimately is human activity. Right? Quran and Hadith is wahi. Fiqh is not wahi. Right? So you have to have logic. It's illogical when you mix and match. For example... When you pick a position, like when you pick that position not to do Rafia then, you're actually not picking that position. You're picking Imam Anifa's principle that seniority of narrators is a stronger basis of preference than number of narrations. But then if you go and pick Imam Shafi's ruling on another matter, that means you're picking that principle, that senior number of narrations is actually a better selection than seniority of narrators. So you've lost your internal logic. It's become arbitrary. It's become random. That is against the spirit of every jurist. It's, no, no, no. It can't be random. It can't be arbitrary. So that doesn't have a scholarly basis. So when you talk about intellectual approach, that they say that that's why they said it's not valid. But they can strictly say it's haram. And I will also tell you, some people also overstate the khalid and say it's farud. It's not farud. It's not farud. It's not wajib either. Some people try to say it's a wajib. It's not wajib. They overstate it. But one of the reasons some of them do that, but that doesn't legitimate, and you should never overstate or understate anything in deen, but because they saw the harmful consequences that was. So one is the intellectual approach says this is an, has internal logical inconsistency. Like I explained to you the other day that there are two theories about light in physics. One is that particle theory of light, that light is made up of particles called photons. The other is the wave theory of light, that light is made up of waves. And you can't use both. <laughs> You want to present a paper at Harvard treating light as particles? Fine. You want to present a paper treating light as waves? Fine. You want on page 3 to treat it as particles and page 5 to treat it as waves? Out. <laughs> conference paper not accepted. You're not allowed to speak at the conference. Go back and do A-levels physics. Yeah, that's how, that's how they respond to you. Alright? You have to pick a paradigm. You have to pick a model. You have to pick a world to operate in. Now again, every usul is not, I showed you one usul, right? And one is the help. I'm giving you one. There's a world and they're interconnected to each other. That I can even show you because you need to know more to see that. There's not everything, not everything I can present to you. Right? When you go on behind the scenes, in fact, you don't really understand how this machine works. But you get to see, okay, I see how the product comes out. These usul are extremely inter, it's an interrelated, interwoven, weaved structure. Okay, it's not just weaved by one person. The Hanafi madhab isn't Imam Munifa. It's Imam Munifa, his 40 senior students, his main two students afterwards, you're talking about centuries of hundreds, actually centuries of thousands of scholars who kept rechecking, cross-checking, upgrading, refining it. It's a huge collective effort. Same thing for Shafi, same thing for Ma, etc. So these are huge collective efforts. So like I told you, the fallibility goes down, like I told you when you have five engineers who make a protocol to check the plane, so it's not just one person. So there's what in the industry we call standards, quality control standards, designed by many people, checked by people, reviewed by people, cross-check, cross-examination, right? That's why the better airlines, they don't have technical faults. Now when you don't have those standards, like AirBlue and Shaheen and etc., you might have some problem, Right? But you have those standards on a problem. Why? Because man is infallible? Emirates are infallible? No, they're fallible. But they've designed a system of standards, cross-analysis, cross-checking. That's what a madhab is. That's what a madhab is. Cross-checking the usul, cross-checking the rulings, cross-checking does this usul really lead to those rulings? Can these usul be combined, etc.? There's a lot more going on. Another reason why you can't combine, another reason not to combine, is sometimes you may end up doing something outside all four madhab. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa Rimalatala position is if you bleed, your wudu breaks. Imam Shafi says if you bleed, your wudu doesn't break. Imam Shafi says that if you accidentally touch the skin of Ghair Mehram, your wudu breaks. 
So like, let's say you're a Muslim living in America and you go to buy something at the store and, you know, you went to the, if you're a real, mashallah, I'm sure our young men would do this. They would first go to the store and see their five cashiers. Is there any man? I'll go to him. I say, oh no, they're all five are women. That's called taqwa. To lower your gaze, you have to do these things. You can't just walk around looking around. You can't lower your gaze like that. You've got to go see from far away which one is the man in the line. I should go to the man. The girl should see which one is the woman in the line. I should go to the woman. But you went late night and there are only two cashiers working and they're both women. All right? So when you went to pay and you took change back in the day of cash and change, so it happens when she gives you the change. Maybe her pinky touched your thumb. Right? Imam Shafi says your wudu is breaking. 100%. Imam Shafi says your wudu breaks. Imam Unifa says it doesn't break. And now the kid who wants to mix and match, he says, okay, on the way to the sh- store I got a cut, but it's okay, I'll be Shafi and I'll still have wudu. <laughs> then when he tests the change, oh, her finger touched my thumb, I'll be Hanafi, I'll still have wudu. And he'll go pray Isha, but his Isha prayer is invalid according to both. You have no validity. You have no scholarly validity for your prayer. Imam Unifa says it's invalid because you bled. Imam Shafi says it's invalid because you touched the cashier's hand. So you end up putting yourself outside scholarly validation. It's a risky thing to do. That's why sometimes you end up in something that's outside deen. Right? I'll give you a real example because this is just the university crowd is full of this. So when I was a university student and I used to go to pray tarawih in a masjid in Chicago, there was a friend of mine. This is this is day and night. This is the only thing you can talk about. It's the glee, the glee, the glee, the glee. All right, so he happened to be praying next to me that night. Mashallah. He prayed every four akats a different way. Right? So when I asked him later, what did you say? I prayed four cuts the Hanafi way, four cuts the Maliki way, four cuts the Shafi way, four cuts the Hanbali way. So I said, but that's 16, that I was 20. He said, the other four cuts I pray my way. I pray however I want. Subhanallah. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, let's say, let's say he didn't even do that. Let's say he prayed eight rakats one way. But he's praying a prayer that no Sahaba ever prayed. You see, because all the madhahib, the collective combined masail of salah can be traced back to a If you pray the Hanafi way, you can be confident, I'm praying definitely the way some sahabi has prayed. If you pray the Shafi way, you can be confident, I'm praying the way some sahabi has prayed. That kid prayed tarawi that night the way no sahaba ever prayed. So you lose your connection. Sanat. Your amal lacks sanat. Your practice does not have a continuous and unbroken chain of transmission back to Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam. And this happens a lot when you mix and match and pick and choose. Another problem is most people will pick and match and mix and choose, mix and match and pick and choose, mix and match and pick and choose, either due to their akal, I already took that off the table for you, and knowledge and ideology, just to what they think, like you all tried to vote today, that was your akal. Remember then I said akal with a little ilm. It was your akal, what you thought was right. What your mind led you to believe was the correct ijtihad. With very little ilm, I give you one proof from each of them. One. I only give you one. <laughs> you thought it was enough. So people will use their akal. I told you that's again back to the ideology based approach as opposed to knowledge. That's another reason. Second, and the next one, what number, next problem in pick and choose, mix and match is people will use their nafs. They'll do what's easier for them. They'll do whatever's easy. And they'll become ease-seeking behavior. And this very quickly actually does end up in a person leading, leading into sin. Right? There's an example of this, but it's so horrific I couldn't say it to you with the women listening. Alright? But I was recently informed of this. I was stunned that how a person can misuse fiqh, mis- misuse this concept of mixing and matching to something that was outright the crude and vulgar. I was stunned. Hmm? So safety lies in the scholarly tradition. Understand this. <laughs> safety lies in the all, otherwise the many. <laughs> all right? There was a time when it was pretty much all of Sunnis were from the Madhabi Usuli tradition. Now it's still the many. But historically, it's always going to be the many, no matter what may happen in the future. All right? So when you pray the Shafi way, the Hanafi way, you know you have thousands of scholars across centuries, across ethnicities, across ethnicities, across races, across cultures, across languages, who cross-checked and verified and approved this way of praying. You can be content and like I said, spiritual approach, focus on fixing your heart. <laughs> you should be says, Hassan on the Fuqah, they took care of these movements, so I could focus on my heart. But what does a young man want? No, no, I'm not going to focus on my heart, I want to learn about the movements. The woman wants it, should I pray like a man? 
I'm going to give you that reading, by the way. Then one of you email, asked me about an email. There's no juristic school that said you should pray like a man. Actually, I think the madhahib are not schools of thought and they're not firqa. This is another fraud that this actually Allah said we shouldn't do firqa. Firqa means difference in aqidah. Difference in theology. Not difference in usul. <laughs> Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and we are not firqas. They're one firqa. They call Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They're differences in usul. They're legal methodologies. That's what they're called. They're called legal method. Madhab in Arabic, that it means zahaba yadhabu. It means a way of traveling. Way of traveling. What? The sharia. Sharia means path. Sharia fasl. Sharia means path. Madhab means a way of traveling the path. So this is a four-lane highway. This is a four-lane highway Stay in lane. Safe driving, stay in lane. Reckless driving, keep changing lanes. Huh? Subhanallah. Alright. Another thing, focus on the spiritual. Pick up any five page pamphlet on how to do the physical aspect of prayer and, t- and take your entire life and the rest of your effort to develop the spiritual aspect of prayer. Alright. That said, very quickly to show you, uh, just do it verbally because we're ready. The ulama, some of them can pick and choose. So first of all, there's fahm, ilm, and tafakku. Even the ulama cannot pick and choose if they only have ilm. No, only if they're master class, they have tafakku. Then they can pick and choose. Second, they also cannot pick and choose for any of the reasons I told you. They can't pick and choose for their nafs. They can't pick and choose for the basis of ease. They can't pick and choose with their akal. They have to pick and choose for two reasons. One is what is called the rurutul a real, valid, new necessity. A new need has arisen. A new masala has come. Right? We might have to mix and match in order to figure out the answer to the question, can you have a test tube baby or not? Right? So that's called the rurutul waqi. Alright? Second is for maslaha. Not for any individual's ease but for the public benefit, greater good, social utility. They may mix and match. So an example of this is right. So it still happens. This is not a myth. It's the hardest closed. It's happening still. But it happens when there is scope for it. It's not a free-for-all thing, right? So for example, Mufti Taki Uthmani, in order to face the current contemporary reality of widespread interest, wanted to design an investment in finance system which was at the very least interest-free. It may still have unfortunate elements of capitalism, right? And capitalism is generally exploitative of the poor, but at least first step is to design a system of investment in finance that at least has this one major haram, because Allah Ta'ala used very strong words in Quran that is harb, Allah Ta'ala declared one, at least take this one thing out. In order to design a system that takes the one thing out, he couldn't stick only to Hanafi usul. So sometimes he takes something from Maliki usul, sometimes he takes something from somewhere. So that's mixing and matching for the sake of a greater good, which is to create the rival to the interest-based system of finance, the replacement to the interest-based system of finance. And why do they do that? Because ultimately what your people are saying is ultimately we do view them all to be valid. That's why they're still there. They're still part of the workshop. We don't take them off the workshop. The Hanafi sitting in the workshop, he can't take the Shafi positions off the workshop. He's sitting, he may be a Hanafi, but it all stays on the workshop. Alright? There are even several other examples I normally give of mixing and matching when we teach this, but because time has run out. Uh, and obviously there's a lot, uh, a whole lot. Fiqh is the, like I told you, in terms of the size of workshop, Hadith is the biggest. And in terms of depth of the workshop, Fiqh is the biggest. Now you're based in the Quran is the deepest, but all of the meanings of Quran is in the fiqh workshop. <laughs> you see, the fiqh workshop has all the tafsir of every verse on it. That's part of the meanings. And it has all the hadith and all their meanings. And it has all the usul of all their jurists. And all the way they applied those usul and drive rulings from their usul. Then all the case law of all the qazis, all the fatwas of all the muftis. <laughs> it's a deep workshop. Alright? It's very deep. That's about all I can show you right now. There's one question I wanted to answer before we leave, because at 440 we have to stop strictly to make the 445 Asr Jamaat. And as I did yesterday, I will come back after Asr and take your questions, men, women, and online, inshallah, from Asr to Maghrib. Is that now, because I had this question, I keep getting this question almost every day. 
What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to learn? So this was a start, right? This was a start. Some of you expressed, where can we get more of this? So we have in our institutes and academies, in Karachi, Zainab Academy for Women, Isan Institute for Men, and online, also called Zainab Academy for Women, but in the men's online world, it's called Tesky Academy. We have courses on a whole range of things. And the most immediate thing, in January, we're launching two levels of courses. One is what I call Quranic studies, as opposed to just Quran. But we're not going to go through the whole Quran on that. That is a short six-month course to give you a flavor of using some of this to understand Qur'an. So going through about four or five major surahs, Surah Kahaf, Surah Yusuf, Surah Yasin, all right? A few such surahs like that, and trying to use all of this in Sina. Thematic tafsir, tafsir through hadith, what did the jurist rulings they derive from certain verses that have ahkam, spiritual aspects, what is Allah Ta'ala trying to tell me in this verse, how should my life change because of this verse, to try to use all of this now to try to get more feeling from Qur'an. So both for the men and women, this is starting uh, in this month of January. Then we have the next level, which we call CIL, Classical Islamic Learning. The first one is non-Arabic based, and that will be done in English, right? The second one is CIL, that's for a person who wants to take a step into the Islamic scholarly tradition, so that requires also learning some Arabic. All right? So in that, one component is learning the Arabic language, and obviously the focus is on Quranic and classical Arabic. And then, all of these topics that we did, so Quran and Hadith and Fiqh and spirituality and some elements of Aqaid, Iman, theology, right? But while learning Arabic along, while trying to engage textually with Qur'an and Hadith and the Fiqh tradition, and as the Arabic gets better, trying to textually engage with some of the works of the scholars, classical scholars in Arabic. Okay, that course is a few years, about three years. Now any person who, after they do these, one of these two courses, they may be, these, these two are open admissions, alright? Then we have another course which is admissions based, and for women, that's a six-year alama course. And for men, that's a ten-year alam course. And you may say, why? Because the men actually will give less hours per week because most of the men are working and so they have less hours per week to give. And the women, they're going to be giving more hours per week. So they will cover that material in six years by giving more hours. I wouldn't call it full-time, but let's say they're three-quarters time, six years, and the men's course is one-third time, not half-time one-third time over ten years, right? But that is admissions-based. And normally admissions to that is based on some level of uh, prior demonstration to severe commitment to scholarship and tazkiyah, taqwa, haya, sunnah, zikr, right? Uh, and sometimes that may take place by taking the Quran studies or CIL, classical Islamic learning course. Someone may fee- feel that they meet that criteria of admission, but that is not open admission, that is admissions-based. Alright? Because obviously that's a big investment on our part also for any institute to make a 10 year investment in a student. Uh, there's an, there's, that commitment has to be mutual. And there has to be some way of trying to assess whether the student is equally committed. Alright? So these are the three courses that we offer. And all these three are also offered online for those who are the online listenership. That's the best we can do. I'm not personally the be all and end all of Islam nor are our institutes and academies. Everybody should go and sit and learn from whichever scholars, alim, sheikh, you heart, your heart feels comfortable and content with. But because we've been getting these questions, it's not like we're going to leave you on Friday if you wish to stay connected. There's a way to continue this beyond Friday. And those are the courses that I told you. May Allah we'll accept our sitting here and coming here and learning from each other and with each other. And inshallah we will resume for those who can stay extra after the Asr break. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين